Hi, my name is Daryl Baskin. It's my pleasure to present the retina, or the first half of the retina portion for the San Antonio Ophthalmology course. Let's get started. So I have no relevant financial conflicts to disclose. I'm attempting to cover about half of the BCSC book. I've split into four parts, uh, as you can see here. My primary source material is the BCSC book from 2023 to 24. There was not a major revision since then, so I've largely stuck with that book. Images are mostly from the BCSC or my images, and a few of them are from some of the, my colleagues that are listed below. Uh, raise your hand if you've seen this book. I'm guessing that most of you have not seen it, let alone read it. Um, <clears throat> and it's pretty dated, it's out of print. It's recommended to me when I was a med student. And uh, it's great. Uh, I'm, I don't know how to do refraction anymore as a retina doctor, but uh, what it is, is essentially you have, a, it's called a program text. Essentially, it, it teaches you something and then it asks you a question. So before you turn the page, you're supposed to think about the answer to that question. So here's an example of one. I'm not going to dwell on it. But essentially, we have an answer to the previous page, 345. And then 346 gives us the next question, if I'm even reading that right. Or sorry, 348, 349. And then on the next page, what you see is the answer to the last page. Uh, and so why am I bringing this up? I think the best way to stimulate your brain is to ask yourself questions and can commit to coming up with an answer or admitting that you don't have one before you look at the actual material that's going to give you that answer. So let's get started. We're going to go on our journey. This is my family. A few years ago, we're trapped. We were living in Burundi. Uh, we went on vacation to Rwanda. This is us coming back from vacation and stuck at uh, security at the border. Some of us are more tired than others. That was my youngest at the time, Trinity. She's now in third grade. So here we go, retina part one. We're gonna cover basic anatomy first. So uh, we're largely gonna focus on the back of this eye model, but there may be a few points that cover the front. So we'll start with vitreous. Uh, it's 99% water, 0.15% macromolecules, Anybody know the normal volume? Uh, you don't have to raise your hand. I just want you to think, what is a normal volume? It's about four cc's. Certainly there are eyes that deviate largely from that. And what are the main glycosaminoglycan component, or what is the main glyc glycosa glycosaminoglycan uh, component of the vitreous? Of these five that are listed here, it's the one the most familiar to y'all. It is hyaluronic acid or hyaluronin. And that's also one of the two main major structural components of the vitreous, that and collagen fibrils. We'll come back to collagen in a moment. Of the soluble proteins in the vitreous, which one is the major one of the most common? It's serum albumin. I don't know why it's not vitreous albumin, but it's al serum albumin. And then you also have transferrin, a couple of others we hypothesize about their purposes. Hyaluronin and con uh, chondroitin sulfate, we're going to talk about just for a moment. Again, hyaluronin is a gag. It attracts water. Chondroitin sulfate is a sulfated gag. It's predominantly found in the vitreous as part of versicam, which is a proteoglycan. I have a little image here, so you can see uh, versicam is that big green stick with those little twigs coming off of it. And then chondroitin sulfate is one of those twigs. Versicam probably participates in the formation of the vitreous gel. And can you think of what syndrome is caused by a disease-causing variation or variant of the VCAN gene? The answer is Wagner syndrome, optically empty vitreous retinal degeneration. And collagen. So collagen fibers are made in the vitreous are made up of uh, a core with type 5 slash 11 fibril, uh, surrounded by type 2 fibrils and type 9 fibrils. Uh, <clears throat> type 9 are thought to basically protect them from uh, de degeneration uh, and vitreous condensation. So what inherited retinal disease is caused by a DCV of a collagen gene? There should be one that pops in everybody's mind. If it doesn't, that's okay. We're about to tell you. It's Stickler syndrome. We'll go into more detail on this in the second half of retina after I'm done talking. It's usually caused by a DCV in collagen 2A1 gene. So there are some low molecular weight solutes in the vitreous, and the book likes to compare their concentrations to plasmas, just like they do with aqueous. So here's the vitreous version. So which is higher, sodium in the vitreous or sodium in the plasma? About the same. What about chloride? Also same. Potassium? It's a little bit higher in the vitreous. Same for vitamin C, ascorbate. Vitreous anatomy, here we go. So 
which elements on this page, on this, sh uh, on this slide, are considered to be remnants of the primary vitreous? Give you a moment to think about that. It's these two, Wiegert ligament and Cloquet's canal. And then which elements are part of or remnants of the tertiary vitreous? <clears throat> Zonule. The secondary vitreous is basically what we consider to be vitreous now. Uh, the vitreous attachments listed here, which one's the strongest? I hope you said vitreous base. Most people would say optic nerve would be the next strongest. Um, maybe the lens capsule. I'm not sure that it's ever gone head to head against the optic nerve uh, attachment. So vitreous base can be evolved in severe trauma. Happened to one of my patients just a few months ago. Another story for another day. So here's some here's the premacular bursa that I've labeled in blue. Here we have the area Martegiani. In case you're wondering where these were, this is them. So the vitreous base extends both anterior and posterior to the aura serrata. Does anybody know about how many millimeters on average? It extends anterior to the vitreous base. It's two millimeters. And then posteriorly, think about it for a moment, about three to four. So there, the book mentions this, uh, so I think it's worth, and this is actually clinically relevant, physiologic changes after vitrectomy. So after vitrectomy, the gel's gone, I theoretically. Uh, because viscosity decreases, there are growth factors and other compounds like drugs are cleared more quickly from the eye. So this, if for patients that, are, that have macular degeneration, then have an RD or have had an RD repaired by vitrectomy at some point in the past, their medications aren't going to last as long. Or they're going to be coming in monthly instead of every six weeks on certain drugs. Oxygen levels in the posterior segment are now higher, thought to be because we no longer have the hyalocytes using up the oxygen, we don't actually know, which leads to accelerated cataract progression, think, think oxidative damage, and this is especially in those over 50. And then post vitrectomy cataract progression can be muted in diabetic individuals. We think it's because their retinas are just so hungry for oxygen, big oxygen sink, they pull that extra oxygen out of the vitreous. Who knows? So basic anatomy, neurosensory retina, the fovea is 1.5 millimeters in diameter, more or less equal to the average optic nerve head. Uh, Parafovia is a half millimeter ring that goes around the fovea, and then the perifovia is a 1.5 millimeter ring around the parafovea. And then we have the near periphery, which some books list, 1.5 millimeter ring that basically goes along the arcades. Important to know the difference between fovea and foveal avascular zone. Uh, foveal avascular zone is defined by FA. It's actually defined by OCTA as well now. Um, normal variability uh, is 250 to 600 microns in diameter. So sometimes it's hard to say that some, a diabetic has an enlarged FAZ uh, unless you happen to have had a baseline measurement if they're within that range. So here's another picture of the aura. This is a dentate process. This is a regular aura bay. And this is an enclosed aura bay. So in the human retina, there are about 100 million rods. There's about 6 million cones. Or you could say 120 million rods, 6 million cones, so 20 to 1 ratio. Rods are highly sensitive, can be stimulated by a single photon. Cones are a lot less sensitive than rods, but they can adapt to a wider range of light intensities um, and respond more rapidly to repetitive stimulation. Uh, more fun facts, fovea has about 140k cones per square millimeter. Foveola contains no rods. 90% of cones are actually outside the fovea. And so where is the highest density of rods? Bit of a trick question. The official answer historically has been just 12 degrees off from fixation. BCSC came out and said, well, you know, there's another high con rod concentration, superior macula, about 176k, but I think officially 12 degrees from fixation is thought to be the best answer, and that probably is uh, off to the side rather than superior, but anyway. Okay, so I, we're gonna go through some of the layers of the retina. I'm gonna streamline it a bit for you. The ILM, not a true membrane, Mueller cell foot plates. NFL is the axons of the ganglion cells, normally not myelinated, unless they have myelinated NFL or medulated near fiber layer. I highlighted three here. These are all nuclear layers. Obviously, the outer nuclear layer, inner nuclear layer, that's pretty clear. The ganglion cell layer is also nuclear layer. It's got the cell bodies, the ganglion cells. The outer nuclear layer has outer nuclear layer, ONL, has the nuclei, the cone, and rods. And then in the inner nuclear layer, you have all these uh, interneurons, if you will, or connecting cells, horizontal cells, amacrine cells, Mueller cells, uh, bipolar cells. 
The OPL, the outer plex form layer, is basically connections between the I and L and the O and L. So it just, if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. I mean, they, they're all interfacing with each other, and this is where it happens. Uh, in the foveal region, the, o, the outer plex form layer is thicker, more oblique. We also call it the Henley fiber layer there. It's almost parallel to the ILM. And so here's a schematic of photoreceptors. We have cone and rod, RPE, we've got the synaptic bodies at the top, nuclei, inner segment, outer segment. External limiting membrane goes kind of between the nucleus and the inner segment. It's not, again, not a true membrane, just like the inner, internal limiting membrane is not a true membrane. And this is, a, again, formed by Bueller cells, but not the foot plates. We have the inner photoreceptor matrix, the myoid, which contains the Golgi apparatus, smooth and rough ER, glycogen, the ellipsoid zone that we talk about so much, or ellipsoid, talked about so much in OCT, and that contains the mitochondria, very reflective on OCT. We have the discs, and cone discs are attached to the plasma, mem plasma membrane, rod discs are not, and the cilium that connects them. So this is a 9 plus 0 configuration, not the 9 plus 2 used in motile cilia. This is going to be the nerdiest stat, nerdiest slide I have up. Actually, there's one other one that's really nerdy. Um, so I want you to think for a moment, if you can, and name some systemic ciliopathies that affect both the retina and the kidney. Okay, and I've got a mnemonic here. I don't have a lot of mnemonics. I get rid of the, more of them each year because people just groan. So Joubert syndrome, Alstrom syndrome, Bardet beetle. Most of you heard of that one. The many fingered man syndrome, Senior Loken. Loken syndrome. So this is the uh, cili for ciliopathy, jabs in the kidney. Maybe that'll help you. Probably won't. You can let that one go. Internal carotid, here's a retinal vascular supply. Starts with the internal carotid artery, which gives off the ophthalmic artery, which gives off both the central retinal artery and the short posterior ciliary arteries. You also have a long posterior ciliary, ciliary artery. It comes off the nasolacrimal artery, the lacrimal artery. And the boundary between retinal choroidal vasculature supply varies according to topographic region, retinal thickness, amount of light present. We'd historically say it's like the inner one third, or excuse me, inner two thirds is retinal vascular supply and the outer one third. The photoreceptors, for the most part, are going to be choroid, choroid. That's not exactly the case all the time, but the retinal vascular system supplies only about 5% of the oxygen used in the fundus. The rest is supplied by the choroid. Pretty impressive. Um, this is a schematic looking at OCTA, which we're kind of getting ahead of ourselves here. I just want to point out a couple things that we can now see. Superior, excuse me, superficial vascular plexus seen on OCTA and on FA is basically supplying the ganglion cell layer. And then the deep vascular plexus, which we can now see on OCTA, not FA, supplies that inner nuclear layer. Okay, outer nuclear layer, choroid. So RPE... This is one of my favorite layers of the retina, if you will. Uh, monolayer of hexagonal neuroectoderm-derived epithelial cells. There's about 4 to 6 million of them. Diameter of 10 to 14 microns in the macula. Compared with RPE cells in the periphery, foveal RPE cells are taller, thinner, more melanosomes, larger melanosomes. And then there are some physiologic rules that the BCSC goes into. Not the retina book, but the fundamentals book. We'll hit some of the highlights here. So the vitamin A regen is pretty important for RPE. Um, it converts all transretinal back to L11 cis uh, retinal retinal. And so uh, ABCA4 is involved in that process of the visual cycle. It's actually on the, the uh, photoreceptor side. Um, so what inherited retinal diseases can arise from a defect in ABCA4? hope most of you know this. Stargardt disease, that should be the obvious one, but also cone rod, retinized pigmentosa. And then what IRDs can arise from a defect in RPE65? So that's LCA2 and retinized pigmentosa. And you may have heard about uh, uh, neparfenag. Uh, I'm not even going to say it right now. Uh, Spark Therapeutics and the drug that they developed, whose name I can't quite say right, uh, Neparpovac or something like that, Vareta gene. It's the first FDA-approved gene therapy that targets uh, targets anything, and it, in this case, it targets RPE65. And unfortunately, I haven't gotten to. Uh, I never got. I've never been trained, and I never actually identified a patient who needs this yet. But not quite in that circle at this point in my career. Um, RPE physiologic roles secretion. So. It secretes uh, 
pigment epithelial derived factor and ciliary neurotrophic factor, which both prevent photoreceptor cell death, VEGF, uh, TIMP, maintains the extracellular matrix. And by the way, what inherited retinal disease is related to dysfunction of the TEMP3 gene, that's Soresby macular dystrophy. And then it, the RPE performs biologic filtration. Um, so there's vectorial transport. Sodium is actively transported from the choriocapillaries towards the subretinal space. Uh, potassium is transported in the opposite direction. Ion gradients across the RPE drive the transport of water from the subretinal space to the choriocapillaris. So what IRD is related to dysfunction of an RPE basal lateral chloride channel? That's best disease. It's caused by a DCV, a best one, best tropin. And phagocytosis. So each photoreceptor sheds a bunch of discs each day. Uh, cone shedding is the most vigorous at dusk, whereas rod shedding is most vigorous at dawn. And then uh, these RPE cells ingest the disc membranes, enclosing them with phagosomes. And then it also, of course, provides the outer blood retinal barrier. So the tight junctional complexes, zonulae occludentes, um, form a girdle uh, near the apices and provide that outer blood retinal barrier. And so now we're going to move on to choroid. Choroid's not quite as interesting to me, um, but we're going to talk about it. So RPE, then you have Brooks mem Brook membrane, and then you have three layers of the choroid, the choriocapillaris, the Sattler layer, and the Haller layer. Those latter two are not fenestrated, whereas the choriocapillaris is. Um, and that basically covers our anatomy uh, section, it, kind of doing a whirlwind tour here. And remember, always wear your iPro. Thanks very much.